close your eyes. Imagine you're in a kitchen. The gas stove ignites, whoosh, and a pan begins to sizzle. A kitchen knife is removed from its rack, shing, and begins chopping. The aroma of a grassy onion permeates the air. You are handed an object, round and smooth with a slight give to the surface. You look down to see a red tomato. Biting into it, you taste its tangy sweet flavor. Not a word has been spoken, but food has communicated with you on a visceral level, stirring all five senses, evoking memories of the familiar and true. You may open your eyes. As a culinary ambassador, I have spoken with everyday people and chefs around the globe, and this scenario could happen in almost any kitchen, almost anywhere in the world, because food is a common language that we all understand, the lingua franca of our planet, and one of the only elements that we all have in common. The ingredients may differ, as well as the way we prepare them, but food is not only vital to our existence, it's an important part of social interactions around the globe. Food is deeply rooted in every culture, expressing heritage and national identity. Since ancient times, people have used food as a cultural exchange, trading and bartering and swapping recipes, and the migration of people slowly introducing new ingredients to different cultures gave food the power to transcend borders and unify. And it's no different today. The simple act of eating together, of sharing different foods, and putting those same foods in our bodies creates a certain level of profound trust and connection. The table becomes the bridge to our cultures, and we can begin to understand and appreciate each other on common grounds. But despite these time-honored traditions, the fast-paced 21st century demands instant gratification, meals on the go, takeout food. It's critical that we go back to the basics to break bread and communicate in order to preserve the voice of our ancestors and protect our future, because we're losing the art of cooking. Native Americans didn't have this choice. In 1883, all Native American traditions were banned, including cooking. Food crops and reserves were destroyed, and recipes weren't well documented, which disrupted and upended their food culture. Today, Lakota chef Sean Sherman, AKA the Sioux chef, is committed to revitalizing the indigenous food culture by educating tribes throughout the country and around the world in order to preserve their language of food. A thriving food culture is a luxury that should never be taken for granted. Preserving traditions is essential. Think back to a favorite meal or comfort food you enjoyed as a child. When I was young, I used to bake chocolate chip cookies with my mom on a rainy day, the quintessential American treat. So why are chocolate chip cookies considered all American? The original recipe dates back to the 1930s when a chef at the Toll House Inn chopped up a Nestle chocolate bar, adding it to the cookie batter. The Toll House cookie recipe became so popular that families began sending the cookies and care packages to troops during the Second World War, delivering messages of comfort and love. In India, one of the favorite rainy season treats is called jalebi, which are deep fried sweets soaked in warm syrup. The recipe traces back to 10th century Persia, where they were made as festive treats during Ramadan. Persian and Turkish traders brought the recipe to India, where today it's the national sweet dish and enjoyed during the monsoon season, bringing joy and warmth on rainy days. Every culture tells a food story. Several years ago, my family and I traveled with close friends to Asiago, Italy, to visit our Italian relatives. Although only my father and I could communicate in Italian, we all got along as we spent days hiking and enjoying the bounty of food in the area, from the cakes at our family's pasticceria to the spread of local fruits, cheeses, and salami during our hikes. One evening, we were invited to a traditional restaurant nestled in the hillside. The banter was lively as we enjoyed good wine and conversation. And as the evening progressed, several large plates of food were brought out and served family style. An older cousin served me, announcing each dish. 
carne, melanzana, cavallo, wait, cavallo, cavallo is now on my plate, cavallo means horse, and our sweet young American friend at the end of the table was a serious equestrian obsessed with her precious horse Fred. But before I could intervene, it was too late. Someone had translated cavallo to Fred. The girl blanched, looking horrified. But in certain regions of Italy, it's not uncommon for doctors to prescribe cavallo, as it's considered very nutritious and high in iron. It's been a delicacy since Roman times and is still eaten around the world today, from Korea to Iceland to Kazakhstan. Culinary preferences are influenced by a society's history, geography, culture, and sometimes religion. To quote French gastronome Jean-Antoine Brillat Savarin, tell me what you eat, I will tell you who you are. His words sum up the inextricable link between a culture and its cuisine. In Brazil, rice is not only part of the national culinary identity, but an equalizer, as both the poor and the wealthy consume it daily. Native Amazonians farmed wild rice for thousands of years, but it was Portuguese colonists in the 17th century who began cultivating it. The production was so successful that it became a protected national staple. Today, outside of Asia, Brazil is the largest producer and consumer of rice in the world. In France, there are between 1,400 to 1,600 different kinds of cheese, which are uniquely French due to many factors, such as geography, climate, and soil, specific breeds of cows, goats, and sheep, and the different grasses they eat, which vary from region to region, from the pastures of the Alps to the lush Loire Valley. Cheese is such an important part of French culture that 96% of the population consumes it. In Italy, there are over 500 different shapes of pasta which are specifically designed to hold the sauce. Heavier sauces need a pasta like orecchiette, which is ear-shaped and can scoop or hold the sauce, while capellini is a thin strand and better used with a lighter sauce. Each of Italy's 20 regions has its own distinct cuisine deeply rooted in tradition. For example, in Florence, the traditional pasta shape is called gili, which translates to lilies. A lily is emblazoned on the city emblem and represents Florence. The world has different tastes because culture impacts flavor. And flavor is a dialogue between people and their environment. And every environment has its own dialect of flavor. Do you like the burning sensation of hot salsa on your tongue? No? then you're probably not a big fan of capsaicin, which is a chemical found in hot chilies that binds to a receptor in your mouth and tongue. People in warmer climates generally prefer spicier foods because spices were used to preserve foods and prevent bacteria in hot, humid regions. Cilantro. People either love it or hate it, which is based on genetics. People who dislike cilantro have a specific gene that picks up the scent of aldehyde chemicals, which are found in both cilantro and soap. Cilantro haters are simply more sensitive to this chemical. Umami is the Japanese word for deliciousness, foods with deep flavor. Think Parmesan cheese, miso, dried mushrooms. A Japanese chemist coined the term umami in 1908, inspired by his wife's savory broth. Japanese foods are steeped in umami, but it would take Westerners nearly 100 years to accept umami as a primary taste. Throughout history, food has been a portal to past civilizations through art, religion, literature, and culture. Food is the translation medium of human experience. Today, we can use technology to discover different chefs and different cuisines. We can go to ethnic restaurants or take cooking classes. We can even travel and go visit the countries themselves. There's never been a better time to explore global cuisines and cultures. Yes, life is busy, and yes, it does take time to prepare a meal, just as it takes time to create anything else that's meaningful. But sharing meals is perhaps the most important way to uphold our culinary heritage, remembering dishes and the people who made them, the significance of the food and how it's prepared. 
We define life moments of joy, grief, celebration, and comfort through food, and sharing that with others creates deep and valuable connections. If you were to invite a guest from another country to your home for dinner, what would you make? What would best reflect the pride that you feel for your family, your culture, and your heritage? Food tells a story. Let your table speak the universal language of food. <laughs>